Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning at United Church of Christ, Congregational, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. God is good. And all the time. And this morning, a couple of <coughs> quick announcements. I want to um, let you know the flowers this morning on the communion table are in honor of someone's birthday today. It's, it's Norma's birthday. So happy birthday to Norma. And thank you for the flowers that we might celebrate with you today. And also, oh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Norma. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and many more. And um, the second thing I want to, um, we want to welcome Alexandra's sister, Elena, who is here from Ukraine, and um, our, uh, our thoughts and prayers continue for all of your family, and we're glad you're here. <laughs> the greeting this morning was um, written 12 years ago today actually, um, as I prepared for this service, this scripture, 12 years ago. Um, the first one, all high and holy, walked by. No time for compassion. Then came the next, faithful disciple, not even a word. Too busy for grace and mercy. A stranger, one of those. I hope she doesn't stop. Oh God, she's stopping. She's helping. She cares. One of the least of these came to my rescue, came to help me when no one else would. A true neighbor did. Let's sing our gathering song. It's 2214 in the songbook or it's on the back of your bulletin. Lead me, guide me. me along the way, for if you lead me, I cannot stray, Lord, let me walk each day with thee, lead me, O oh Lord, lead me, one more time. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Now our welcome to worship this morning is a little different. As you're looking at me, you are the left side and you are the right side. That was hard for me to do, by the way. <laughs> so the left side begins. Single parent trying so hard to hold my family, myself, together. Do you see 
Do you see your neighbor? I mean, really see. The neighbor that lives on your street, in your town, your nation, or halfway around the world. Do you see me? Let's sing our... Join me in the gathering prayer. Ever present God, as followers of Jesus, help us to see ourselves in the lives of the helpless and the needy, with those we would ignore or oppress, and with those we have called enemies, that we may serve all people as your hands of love and sit at the feet of those who need our compassionate care. Amen. And now I welcome you to take a moment and turn and face someone else and offer a wave or a sign of peace or a virtual hug or an air kiss. <laughs> So, how was the week just passed? Yay? Yay? Eh? Eh? Okay. Some, eh? Some? All right. All right. Well, we pray for, if, if we've had some of these or some of these, we pray for God's presence in your life in the week to come, that it, you might uh, 
start to turn that dial up a little bit. Um, I have a few prayer requests this morning. Um, Deborah has texted in asking for prayers again for her mom, Norma Bartlett, and for her friend, Linda Howell. So our thoughts and prayers are with them this morning. Also, um, I want to lift up prayers for the families and the community in Highland Park, Illinois, um, after that 4th of July shooting. Um, that whole community is just really suffering, and I can understand why. Um, so our thoughts and prayers are with them. I watched one of the um, services of one of the um, women at, at a local synagogue and was just so touched by the rabbi's words and what she had to offer. Um, was just so beautiful and so amazing. So um, I, I think um, that community is in very good spiritual care, but our thoughts and prayers go out to them um, today and every day. Also, um, for Ron Orchard, who continues to um, come towards the end of his time at the uh, Webster Comfort Care, um, I saw him again this week, and he was a real chatterbox. So we, we talked about a lot of things, and it was really wonderful. Um, also, for Nancy Schlaffer, who is at the Leo Center of Care um, over at St. Anne's, and Nancy has kind of declined a little in the past few days. So um, uh, if you call, she may be short of breath. She's on oxygen most of the time, or all the time. And um, talking is difficult. So um, if you call, if you go visit, tell her she doesn't have to talk. Because <laughs> uh, you know Nancy, she'll want to talk about everything. I walked in the door and she looked at me and she said, oh, it's almost August, isn't it? I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> So she's very alert and very aware, but um, our thoughts and prayers are with her today. Others that I'm not aware of? Yes, yeah, Skip. Okay. For a friend, Lynn, and her husband, Greg. Lynn is in hospice care at home, so our thoughts and prayers are with her. Someone? Yeah. All right, thoughts and prayers for Mike, Mark, sorry. Mark and Liz Green are, are fairly new to our congregation, and their kids are very active in Sunday school, and we're just happy to have you and your extended family here, but our thoughts and prayers are with you as you lost your dad on the 30th. So um, we, we hold you in our arms of love. Judy. Prayers for Denny and for Judy as she cares for him as they, they journey through this, uh, this, this time together. Absolutely. Yeah, for Tom. Um, my sister had cancer, oh. kidney cancer, and her kidney taken out of her left arm. Right one is not doing too well, and she's got problems. You know, having a little bit of OK, prayers for your sister and for Tom, right? He's still continuing on the journey. Yeah. All right. All right. Others, let's be together in prayer. God, this morning we look up and we see the bright sun and the blue sky. And we think, how can anything be wrong with the world? And yet tomorrow we'll wake up and find out that maybe some things were wrong with the world today. But help us to live in the moment. Help us to enjoy these days of sunshine, of great times with family and friends, swimming in the lake or the pool, doing all those things we love to do. And God, for those who may be having a struggle today, we pray for them as well. We pray that they might feel your presence in their lives and know that in all the prayers and good thoughts and positive energies coming from this place, that they know that your presence is with them. 
God, we pray for our communities across the bay, in the city, where there is such struggle every night, every day. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones and for those who are, have been victims of shootings. We pray for places in the world where there is continued struggle, for oppressed people everywhere, for those who struggle in finding justice. We pray especially for Ukraine and all her people and especially the children there who are finding places of peace and comfort in everything but home. God, today we pray for us, for this congregation gathered, for congregations gathered all over the globe. We pray for your spirit to be upon us, as we try to do and be all that you call us to. Now, oh God, we thank you for silence. Silence where we can come to you and pray those things that we don't talk about out loud, but they still weigh so heavy on our lives. In that silence this morning, hear our prayer. And hear us, O God, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus shared with his disciples when they asked him, how do we pray, what should we say? And he said very simply, you might try words like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. And if if you're watching from afar, good afternoon or good evening, whenever it may be that you are here. Um, And I know I say this all the time, but thank you for being here. Whether here is in this building or here is wherever you are in your life, you matter to God and there is a, a reason that you're where you are. And thank you for being there and sharing yourself. The scripture today is Luke 10, 25 through 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, 
And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. And then Jesus asked him, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Amen. Some of you may remember a few years ago when the uh, theme of Summer Mission Week was Ubuntu. And Wendy and the kids tried to explain to us what Ubuntu meant. But I thought I'd just re refresh <laughs> your, um, your minds. Ubuntu is a philosophy born in South Africa. It, was, um, it celebrates the human spirit and focuses on people's allegiances and relationships with each other. In a nutshell, it means a person is a person only because of other people. And so we're going to try and share that feeling of Ubuntu as the Good Samaritan story does it so well.
Ah, the good old Good Samaritan story. So many people love to dig into this story. Even still. We know it, we hear it, we recite it over and over again. We tell people, oh, be a Good Samaritan, will ya? We try to make it more than it really is sometimes, though, I think. Because there's really only two important things you need to take from this pretty powerful tale from Luke's Gospel. Number one is, who is my neighbor? And number two, go and do likewise. That's it. You don't need to worry about how a lawyer asks Jesus about eternal life and Jesus turns the question back to the lawyer and then the lawyer answers citing scripture from Deuteronomy and Leviticus and then circles around one more time, this time asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds to all that mess with this all too familiar story of the Good Samaritan. A priest and a Levite pass by an injured man and trudge dutifully off into the horizon. They're too busy to help. Too bound by their religious obligations. Too preoccupied with the next thing they must do. Too busy to understand the point of Jesus' story. That a neighbor is anyone in need. Now, Jesus doesn't blame them for doing nothing. He doesn't accuse them of being heartless. After all, they're on the way to the work they've been called to do. And they they can't properly serve if they are temporarily rendered unclean by contact with the dead body which they thought he was. So they quite reasonably keep their distance. Even though Jesus describes the mugged traveler as half dead, people with serious work to do must take precautions. And in the last two and a half years, we've learned all about precautions. So the priest and the Levite pass by. And as we 21st century readers watch, we kind of cringe. We kind of cringe at their sense of superiority. Because we recognize who our neighbor is. Or is not. Or is not. And we feel justified by our reading of Jesus' parable and confident that we could do better than the priest and the Levite. Some people today think that this is the way all religious people are, obsessed with ritual obligations and therefore blind to human suffering and anguish, or at least not willing to give it much more than a cursory glance. These folks find satisfaction and feel smugly justified by pointing out the religious scruples of the priest and the Levite. Like most convincing fundamentalists for whom God's will is the single cause of all human ills, wars, terrorism, hate, bigotry, homophobia, even climate change, as belief in God. They clearly recognize that religiously motivated people, like the priest and the Levite, are the real problem. But in their view, although we need to remember that our neighbor is anyone in need, we also need to forget all of the religious stuff and simply go and do likewise. After all, we can follow the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan. We can obey the admonition of its teller. We don't really need any sense of God in order to do these things, do we? It's just something a good person would do, whether they're associated with any church or synagogue or mosque or anything. It's just something good people do, regardless of their beliefs. Then suddenly, we sense this uncomfortable feeling that things just aren't quite right here. We seem to have missed something. It's just all too easy. So we distill Jesus' story down into an exemplary fable, teaching that our neighbor is anyone in need, and we encourage hearers to go and do likewise. But we miss something. Because just as surely the priest and the Levite who traveled the same length of road between Jerusalem and Jericho missed something. Now, most of the time when we hear this story or read this story, we stop at this point. But I'd like to suggest 
Yet the story doesn't end with the Samaritan stopping and helping. Because that's just the beginning. More than half the story is devoted to the Samaritan's actions. Feeling pity. Bandaging wounds. Pouring wine and ointment, lifting the injured traveler onto his animal, caring for him at the inn and securing the innkeeper's hospitality. It was an excessive amount of detail if the only point is to go and do likewise. I think more is being proposed here in the details of the story. I don't think the extravagance with which Jesus describes the Samaritan's action is meant only as instruction in first aid procedures. I think it's an invitation. We are invited ourselves to feel that tingle with the sting of the wine in the wound. We're invited to feel calmed under the soothing caress of some healing ointment. To enjoy the relief of someone taking charge of what has been a totally nightmarish situation. And finally, to experience the extravagant welcome of being checked into the hotel compassion, all expenses paid. Before we go and do likewise, or go and do anything at all, we're meant to know the level of care and compassion of the stranger who finds us on the road, abandoned. Who lifts us up and provides hospitality for us. Far beyond providing instruction and practical morality, the actions of the Samaritan stranger open a window for us to recognize nothing less than the care and the compassion of God. Now, I think the parable of the Good Samaritan addresses us not in the language of the imperative, what we are to do, but in the language of the indicative, of who we are to be. And to recognize our own deep need for compassion. In 400 AD, St. Augustine interpreted the parable in this way. He said, the traveler is humanity. The Samaritan, the outsider greeted with suspicion and hostility, is Jesus. And the inn is the church, the hotel compassion, where broken travelers come and rest and get refreshed. Like so many other parables of Jesus, this story proposes a major sense of welcome and restoration and invites us to come and be a part of it. I don't always like St. Augustine. But this is some pretty powerful stuff. Because I think the church today needs to be something more than a sense of being justified, more than a new law, more than a new and improved interpretation. We need the hospitality of the hotel compassion, where we may be refreshed by the care of others, where we may learn to have eyes of compassion, which is to say we need the vision of Jesus. Before we go rushing down Jericho Road imagining ourselves the hero of the story, because we surely know we would act in the way of the Samaritan, right? We need to be quiet. We need to allow ourselves to be comforted. We need to listen in on the conversation in that hotel of compassion, where all the talk is about God's love and our love for others. We need to listen carefully, for the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? And that's how we live into our mission. That's how we live into our ONA statement. That's how we live into being a wise congregation. That's how we become the church in the world today. Soon, this church will embark on one of the most crucial processes in the life of any church, the search and call for a new pastor. So as you move forward in this process, 
I hope that you'll always remember two things. Number one, the importance of knowing your neighbors, especially those in need. And number two, how can we show those neighbors the compassion that we're called to share? In other words, how do we follow that command? Go and do likewise. Amen. Oh yeah. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of witness, number 541 in the New Century Hymnal, or it's on the back of your bulletin. They asked, who's my neighbor? Should I do a good deed? Then Jesus related a story and said, It's anyone who has a need. Yes, anyone who has a need. There once was a traveler set on by thieves who beat him and left him to die. A priest and a Levite each saw him in pain, but they turned away and walked by. Yes, they turned away and walked by. A certain Samaritan then came along to bind up his wounds and give aid. He took him to stay at an inn until well, and for all the service he paid. Yes, for all the service he paid. I know who's my neighbor and whom I should love, for whom I should do a good deed. For Jesus made clear in the story he told, 
It's anyone who has a need. Yes, anyone who has a need. Whether large or small, old or young, may you know yourself blessed and loved by God. And may that love shine in you and through you to brighten the lives of all you meet. Amen. Please have a seat and let's quickly take a look at what in God's name we're doing. Um, first off, there's, an, there's a couple inserts in your bulletin this morning, and one is um, about the Strength in the Church offering, which is one of our all-church 5 for 5 national offerings. We'll be collecting that next Sunday, so... Um, Take a read and see what Strength in the Church is all about. Um, I think you'll see that it's um, part of what it means to be a good neighbor. So um, take a look at that, and we'll receive that offering next Sunday. Um, also, our first concert of the season is Wednesday, this Wednesday, in three days Wednesday. So all of you that have signed up, I hope you got the email from Sue Rindell with the task sheet and who's doing what, when, and where. So we're all excited about welcoming Allegro to our bandstand front yard this, uh, this week. And I hope uh, those of you who uh, are able can come and listen and enjoy um, some great music as we celebrate our um, various agencies in Webster that do so many great things for people. Uh, good neighbors. Hello. Um, and then the other insert in your bulletin is, um, oh, no. OK. <laughs> uh, we won't have I'm just so excited. <laughs> Everybody. And Sunday morning, after uh, the following day, we'll be a little goodies and a little church as well. And that is quite optimistic for us. So much vacation. Oh, we are celebrating our 12 years with Carl. And it's 27 years of ministry, right? 28. 28, did I think? Yeah. 28. Oh, no, we can do that, though. Read the number. Yeah. I'll do it, because then it's through the microphone, Carol. Oh, okay. It's, um, you can call in to Cheryl DeTucci at 261-7177 or 203-1025. I'm assuming one is home phone and one is cell phone. Wouldn't it be greater if your phone rang, both phones rang at the same time? 
Cheryl wouldn't know what to do. Anyway. And, um, yeah, and, and I, I hope many of you will be here also on Sunday the 28th, which will be my last Sunday here, um, as one of my last official acts of ordained ministry, I get to baptize my granddaughter. So um, I'm really excited about that. So I hope you'll, you'll be able to be here then, too. And some special folks will be here um, as well. So it's going to be a great weekend. And then the next day, we, we head south. So <laughs> Other announcements I'm not aware of this morning. All right. Sing Amen. Sing Amen. Sing Amen. Sing Amen, Amen. Oh, sing Amen. Sing Amen, Amen. amen. 